it's certainly going to be a nail biter as precincts close in the United States and the world's largest economy awaits a new head of state. What does it all mean for the Philippines? Kintin joins me now for an, the analysis and we'll also look at the impact on the economy with the, and the markets with Jun Kalaikai. He's the head of uh, research and marketing at ANA Securities. Welcome, gentlemen. Such an exciting day for all of us. But first, let's get through uh, uh, what you've uh, delivered today, Kintin. Let's talk about U.S.-Philippines ties. Take us back to what's at stake here for the Philippines. Sure, Reg. And let's start with the people itself. You're looking really at, you know, estimates vary. You know, Pew Center puts it at 2.5 million Philippines. Filipinos. The State Department puts it at 4 million. However, the numbers all pan out. You're looking at the second largest Asian American community in the United States. So a big jump in terms of what they've been from the past and now looking at a political force exactly with, the, with regard to the U.S. elections. Now, most of that population is in California and goes down the round to Illinois, Texas. And out of the seven main key states that you're looking at. Only two of them are actually traditional Republican states voting in the red. But where the analysis gets interesting is when you look at these uh, swing states or battleground states here, Nevada, Florida, the big numbers here where the push is for the Philippine community is 123,000 in Nevada, Florida. These are the toss-ups wherein the, the 270 seats can be won or lost for either Trump or Clinton. So you look at these states, Nevada, Florida, Pennsylvania. Battleground states. And basically it goes Even down Pennsylvania. the road. Even Pennsylvania. is still in place. So it's still a strong part in terms of the population there. So you roughly talk about half of that being voting age. There is there are a force to reckon with in terms of these battleground states for this particular election. Well, certainly uh, the Filipino community was an important, one of the more important minority groups because uh, Clinton and uh, her daughter, Chelsea Clinton, had made, uh, you know, campaign stops through, uh, at some stage to the Filipino community there. But let's talk about what's at stake here for us here at home. I know there's a huge, uh, there's a foreign policy pivot going on at the moment. Moment, but there's no denying that there's still deep economic and uh, business ties between the Philippines and Manila. Well, Reg, certainly. Between the, the Philippines, I should say, and Washington. And Reg, certainly, when you, you, you're absolutely right when you talk about the fact that, you know, every aspect of the economy, you've got the U.S. imprint on that or ties at stake. You look first at remittances. Top source, 30% basically of remittances come from the U.S. I mean, that's going to be heavy from, and that's a big source of the economy, too, especially when you look at the trade balances and you also look at our overseas cover for the gross international reserves. I mean, and especially with the resulting tensions in the Middle East, this is a good hedge in terms of all these currencies coming in. The next thing you look at also when you talk about foreign direct investment, again, these are not the footloose investments, as June will talk about portfolio investments later, but this is really boot to strap to the concrete in the Philippines. You, not, you knock out Netherlands for a bit because even some U.S. companies are investing out of the Netherlands given and their tax haven. And just forcing it through Netherlands, exactly, and, that's and, right. and their corporate incentives. They are technically the second largest source of FDI in the Philippines. That really means the biggest multiplier of jobs. And we're not even talking about just the BPI industry. It's, well, you're looking at it being basically roads, bridges, tollways, telecom services, and whatnot. And you move on further down the line, you know, in terms of trade. This is where it gets really interesting. The nuances put it in there. The chart that shows you that, you know, they are the second largest export destination for Philippine goods. But what's interesting here, you know, in light of all these pronouncements about China having $24 billion in deals, the idea there is they have a trade surplus. Uh, we have a trade surplus with them of $1.5 billion similar to Japan. So this is actually a positive trade. Does that mean we trade. import more products from the U.S. than we export? Actually, we, we're on the plus side. We actually so export the more. So there's more foreign exchange coming in. That balance is heftily in favor of the Philippines, similar to Japan. Whereas China, you compare that as a $5.9 billion deficit. So again, a healthy relationship. Meaning again, we import more, more from, from China, China than we export to China. There. So the key thing here to remember is it's a positive, enduring, layered, multi-layered relationship and lots at stake and lots to play for, especially with a new person in the White House. Lots to play for and definitely lots on the table. A new person in the White House as well as we said, uh, the foreign policy shift that is underway in the Philippines right now. Let's talk, let's go to June Kalaikai now. June, uh, you know, the markets have, last time we spoke about this, you said that the markets had essentially priced in a Clinton win. Is yes. that still where you're standing at the moment? Yes, we're still uh, thinking that the market, I mean, if you look at how the markets moved over the recent periods, uh, not just in the Philippines, in fact, uh, globally, uh, if, if there were numbers that were showing that Clinton was going to run away with the election, the market uh, starts to go up. But then, uh, I think 11 days prior to the election, there, there was, was a flight email. to save yes. haven assets. Uh, it, it narrowed the, the, the lead of Clinton percentage-wise in the surveys and the polls, and uh, the market started to correct. And 
investors want to save for havens. So I think the market is really favoring a Clinton administration. Now, what, what, what we're seeing here is, you know, it's almost similar to what we had uh, last May. It's, it's, it's a battle between the status quo and change, radical change for that matter for, for Donald Trump. Clinton represents the status quo and uh, Trump represents change. So it's, it's a very close contest. Uh, I've heard a lot of political analysts talk about this. That it's going to be very close, but at the end of the day, they say it's going to be Clinton. Well, you talk about change, also the flip side of that is uncertainty. Talk to us, given the fact that it's still neck and neck, what, are the, what is the impact basically of a, a Trump or a Clinton presidency on the Philippine economy from a portfolio investment perspective and investments in general? Well, from, from a from a portfolio perspective, the Clinton administration would just simply be the same policies that are that, that already in place. So the ball would be in our courts, how, how uh, our government uh, defines its uh, policy towards the United States. So I think the first thing, the first task there is if and when Clinton wins or even Trump wins, the first order of the day is for us to make represent, representations and, and talk about how, thing, how to uh, put things in order. Remember. Um, in terms of trade, both are actually um, thinking about renegotiating their trade uh, agreements. So how do we get into that? I mean, during the debates, they were mostly talking about Mexico and the Latin American countries. But I think that that would also have an impact on trades with the Philippines. And certainly both, are, both are against TPP as well, at yes. least in terms of their campaign rhetoric. Right. That's right. right. The latest, uh, I want to get to that point, the latest Bloomberg poll found that in the event of a Clinton victory, we are looking at a very watered-down version of Trans-Pacific Partnership. And yes. on the other hand, in the event of a Trump presidency, you're looking at a situation where he's going to renegotiate all the terms of the TPP, that being it, the, the uh, Obama administration having been the architect of that I want to bring back that uh, export uh, data chart and ask you will that not impact the trade relations between the US as Clint Clinton had been pointing out we have a trade surplus with the US meaning we export more to the US yes. than we import from them no, I, well so far the TPP is, is not yet in effect it, it, it's still it's still uh, being talked about so if it does not get into play then I think that the the relationships will remain the same now, it really all depends on how we go about our, uh, how, do, how we redefine our relationship with the United States. And there has been specific uh, rhetoric coming from the president that he prefers to be trading with other countries rather than the United States. So maybe the question there is, do we need the TPP after all, given that there is such a thing as the RCEP, China's the Regional Comprehensive <laughs> right. Right. Economic Partnership that China is leading at this stage? Well, I guess when you talk about trade, it's it's all addition. I mean, if, if we can trade with as many countries as we can, diversify our trade portfolio, all the better for us. I mean, if we concentrate really on the U.S. and the U.S. suffers another recession, we're going to be dragged down. That's what happened. But if you're able to diversify your portfolio, EU, China, Southeast Asia, the U.S., Japan, then if, if uh, something happens to any of those areas, then there's a buffer for us. So I think it's the, the name of the game is diversification of our portfolio. Well, also the name of the game is hedging. And you think about it, I mean, without the TPP, but RCP led down by China. Yes. Talk to us about how a new U.S. administration, regardless of who wins, yes. does position itself to get into that vacuum and still try to claim ascendance economically and at least in other in interest-wise. Well, we, we, have to, we have to consider how each of those candidates actually look towards China. I think Clinton is more diplomatic about it. Clinton is more open to, to talking about China. But Trump actually, during the first presidential debate, if I recall correctly, he was calling China as a currency manipulator. He's more, he's more uh, uh, engaging, he's more confrontational in his approach. So, Threatening to put tariffs up on <laughs> <laughs> imports from China, right? I, I think tariffs and walls, <laughs> let's not there forget. I, I think that's the new norm now. You have to be confrontational with, with uh, your, even your friends. So I think that's, that's where it co comes in. What about BPOs? That's been one of the flashpoints throughout this whole electoral cycle for us in the Philippines. Um, yes. The AmCham has sounded the alarm that you know BPOs here may suffer, not just because of, of the president's foreign policy shift, but as we keep saying, there's a bit of a confluence of factors here. Uh, if the U.S. decides to be more protectionist in its approach to trade, that right. might mean the, uh, less inflows to the Philippines and as well uh, remittances might get impacted. Right. Well, if you, again, recalling, recalling the first debate, uh, Trump actually said that 
in terms of jobs, his priority was to bring back jobs to the U.S. And also punish the ones who outsource jobs overseas. Exactly. And one of, his, one of his incentives was to bring down corporate taxes in order to... Yeah. Lower cost of doing encourage, business as well. Encourage business to go back to the mainland rather than outsourcing it. And of course, they were pointing to Mexico that they had, they had outsourced a lot of manufacturing jobs from Mexico. But again, it's just, Mexico is just an example. They also have jobs out here in the Philippines and other areas. So I think that will also potentially impact on, on, uh, on, on our BPOs, and not just BPOs, but all other areas of businesses where Americans have presence here. Yeah. Well, given that eight that out of 10 companies that the BPO sector serves is based in the U.S., that's exactly. a pretty high stake. Absolutely, but then again, we're looking at a weaker peso, which again, could be more incentives for the businesses to set up shop here. Is, it, that, is that not right? That should come to the balance of the equation, but really, I think that the most important thing that, that's missing right now is policy, regulation. How is government, the Philippine government for that matter, defining uh, it's, is it welcoming to American and Western investors, or are we just uh, really more biased towards coming in, or, I mean, inviting new investors from the other side of the globe? Well, it's certainly going to be one for the history books today. Thanks for your insights, Jun Kalaika, Head of Research and Marketing at ANA Securities.